exciting summer after a year after university where I read about John Cage and listened to Hildegard Resterkamp and just suddenly got really excited about all that stuff I didn't care about two years ago. <laughs> so then I went back and did an MA. That's not so easy for good and did it on contemporary composition and politics. <laughs> Is that it, whilst I was in architectural college, you see, I was like, you know, Daniel Cohn Bendit came to Portsmouth and spoke to us in 1968, you know what I mean? It was like, I hated the fucking world, you know what I mean? By, sort of by that time, you know, having gone through yippies, hippies, and all that stuff, I was like, this fucking world is shit, you know what I mean? I just fucking hate it. I was an anarchist and I was like totally against everything, you know, the establishment, the fucking H bomb, the the war in Vietnam and, and everything, all these colonial wars, everything. I was just like, you know, it made me, I was just totally furious, really, like, constantly, you know what I mean, about it. So that's sort of like, the tone of my life was set by that kind of like, hatred of the establishment and the way the world was and wanting to change it. The whole disappointment about the, about the architecture thing was, I thought, oh, well, maybe I could make a go of this. And, but then I realised after years of doing it, after three years of doing it, that the hidden agenda was that you were, you were being trained to become this professional who was better than and, and had to appear to know more than all the building trades. So you had to kind of go on site and like know more about brickwork than you know than the bricky and know more about electrics than the, you know. Uh, so, and you, you never did. So that ended up with me doing the survival scrapbooks because I just wanted. I kept asking the question, well, what is architecture? What I want to know what it is really, and uh, nobody could answer me thoroughly. So I just started to look at it in terms of. But a Cajun sort of thing, actually, of sort of going back to scratch and asking basic questions, which turned out to be about basic life support, you know. I thought after that I was going to be like an author, I'd be able to, you know, make a living as an author or something like that, because they were quite successful. But, but it never happened, you know. The next, the next project I did, the publisher went bust, and the whole alternative... <coughs> scene went, you know, it's kind of like the, the Federation of Radical Booksellers went, it's just started again actually, but you know, it went and... When was that the thing? beginning of the 90s? That was in the sort of 70s really, oh, 60s, yeah. yeah. In these, maybe even 60s, I don't know when it started, but there was a kind of, you know, every town had a radical bookshop and you could, you could publish something and actually sell it, you know, wow. like a thousand copies or something like that. So that's my, my survival was like that, you know, and then when I did the PhD at... Um, at Royal College of Art, and again, I persuaded them to pay my fees, and I just had to, and I had a part-time job, and so now I was, so, and then from, when I got that PhD, I got this job I've got at the moment, which is the first job I've had, really, I mean, 2002 is the first proper job I got, in all those years, it's, it's terrible, isn't it? Well, and then I got contract. two, yeah, actual proper, like, job, where you don't have to worry about getting employed the next year, and that's another t point five. At Westminster, so that's what I've been doing for the last ten years. Mm. So I'm about to retire now. So it's like got a quick job in for retirement. <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's not a bad plan. I've never tried to get money. How do you survive? <laughs> I work three days a week teaching um, as a sort of peripatetic teacher at a school in South London, and that's make sure secondary school. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then just make sure I live within my means. I mean, it's a, it's a funny one that it's, on the one hand, more recently, like with that um, article, Falling Floating Leaves, that I gave you, mm. um, which was a thing of a sort of much more proud look at people being able to live off the welfare state, and turning it around in a way, in the kind of, dominant ideology of like the scoundrel, the, the kind of feckless scoundrel working, a non-working poor, he turns around to say that a lot of very creative and brilliant people, that's their only means of sustaining this brilliant practice that you all love and see the benefit of in society. 
The other ways I've survived so psychologically, I was saying, and, and, and in art practice is, I was going to say, is by, by joining collectives, by working collectively with people, sometimes in big groups of people, quite often, usually more often in big groups of people. And the way that, the, the type of collectives that I've been most excited by are ones that have been democratic kind of thing, you know, been open to people, not been like a pop group, not like a group of friends that get together, but something that's, Anybody can join, you know, I feel comfortable with that. But also, it's kind of quite um, powerful because, like, we just had a show in here with a previous show here was about Brixton Artists Collective, which was in the 80s. And that was, you know, big. It was like I don't know, 30 or 50 people. Brixton Gallery allowed me to think I could invite every person I came across with a Polish name to show together and see what happened. See how I felt. See how whether the work had any Polishness about it, or you know what was that? What that was about. So, and where else can I have done that? You know, it have to be a big space to to think that. So, so that that collective allowed me to think thoughts that I wouldn't have been able to have if that didn't exist. Sort of thing. You see what I mean? So that I think that's the thing about. And same with the Scratch Orchestra before that, which is which wasn't a collective exactly, but one of the most radical things they did. And I don't know if you remember this, but they, 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 the concerts, which were the main sort of focused activities, focused activities together, were organised by the youngest people first. Mm. So that like, basically put Michael Parsons and Cornelius and, and people, that put them out of the picture. They never had a concert because they were, they're, you know, they're now 70s sort of thing. So it's funny because, that, so that was a very radical thing to do to somebody that was, you know, as like the British Stockhausen Cornelius was, or something like that. But you know, he was willing to kind of go, yeah, okay, youngest people first, and like young people really valued. So, um, so that allowed things to happen. You know, it's just like an extraordinary kind of situation to be in, where suddenly the the establishment structure of hierarchy and you know, you make your way and all that sort of thing. You have to speak right, you know, before you kind of move to the next level and everything. Suddenly, just psh, mm. gone. You know what I mean? And suddenly you. Doing a, well, you know, concert. What's that going to be? Oh, whatever you want. You know, you can use this. You can use that. You can. We'll help you. But you can do whatever you want. You know. So you know, your your brain suddenly goes. Bless, you know, from being. Yeah. For me, the, the biggest turning point was uh, doing that project with Ultra Red, and meeting people who are interested kind of equally between politics and art, and seeing a bunch of people that were all just as confused as me as me, and how to to fuse those two together. They, they, for instance, they opened it up by having, we all went and listened for, for a few minutes in a space near the area, and um, then come back and just say what we heard. And it's a technique from um, Paolo Ferreira, the car that he wrote book, The Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Mm. And it was, it's all about techniques to, to get away from that role of teacher, and student as a kind of, he calls it the banking theory of education, where I've got all this knowledge stored in me and I need to input it into you because you're a blank slate that knows nothing and back into what should be as a reciprocal conversation where I have valuable things to give to you and you have valuable things to give to me. Mm. So by starting with silence and describing it in your own language, it breaks down a lot of barriers. The education groups with Lucy, it's called Old MFA, an alternative Master of Fine Arts, Okay. Um, I mean, for me, it's more honestly, it's a kind of it's a space for for people to freely meet and exchange ideas and to teach where they feel comfortable teaching each other. Mm. It's, and it's completely, or it's it's as non hierarchical as possible at the moment. So everyone's supposed to sh uh, share the role of chairing, share the role of note taking, updating the blog share the role of um, researching a subject to teach each other and crits to show each other work and stuff like that. So it's, it's designed to be non-hierarchical and, uh, you know, it's certainly influenced from that Paolo Ferreira mm. stuff that we did with Ultra Red. One of the problems of working collectively or doing these projects within the kind of collective, like doing the shows I did at Brixton Gallery or whatever, is that you kind of, after 10, 15, 20 years, you kind of think you're not being historicised, you're not being, you know, you don't get national reviews, you get the occasional review in a, some obscure art mag or something like that. And it's sort of not enough to sustain you, you know. So writing and publishing things has been 
an increase, probably an increasingly important part of um, that. And, and, and the PhD, which about explaining cinema, I mean, that was meant to be a model of how to historicise a collective. Not, not in an ideal way, but I mean, in a, I was trying out different methodologies of how you capture a collective. If you want to change the world, then you've got to have people who've got to take on your ideas, read your book, whatever, you know what I mean? So this is the recent, pro recent project, which is, again, a collective project, you know what I mean, which, surprising you're not in, really, but it's like 23 people choosing uh, art, art playlists about the way music has affected them politically in their lives, yeah. which was um, a web project. It's obviously, in the last 10, 20 years, we've been sort of mm -hmm. using wikis and things much more. But Like, like a um, mixtape based on the idea of mixtapes. It's mixtape, yeah, it's kind of mixtapes. They were, they were real CDs, so that you get a picture of the real CD. But that's, <coughs> for some reason, that works much better as a book than on web, you know, the fact you can do what you're doing now to it. One thing I was thinking of is how, how are all these kind of philosophers that are pushed onto fine art students useful to them in their everyday practice? And like, I was reading Paul Mason recently in his, in his optimist self, saying that even if you don't get Foucault and you don't get Deleuze and Qatari, even if, even if you can't make sense of it, it's filtered into the public conscience. People understand more about power now than they ever have, even if they haven't read it. Instead of Foucault and Derrida in art schools, they could have uh, comedians come in and uh, do the kind of thinking that, that thinking comedians do, but with the idea of may maybe the art and comedy could be a bit more, there could be a bit more crossover rather than the emphasis on these rather dry theorists, mm. you know what I mean? Or at least, again, you said it's space for all things. Yeah, I read Foucault and, you know, I get a lot out of the struggle with trying to understand it, but um, at the same time, I sort of feel like there's a stand-up inside me that's very, very repressed and, you know, <laughs> like, like, and I'd like to, or I'd like to be in the company of one or something like that, you know, I'm like a comedian. Yeah, I mean, the avant-garde movement was quite funny, wasn't it? Like most most of it had a lot of humour on it and like Dada, when we, when yeah. We I mean, about yeah, Cage, definitely, yeah, it was, yeah. Yeah. It was definitely full of humour. Yeah. Like yeah. say in that in that piece for that American T V show, you know that people might laugh. And yeah. He says that the laughter is the laughter is not necessary, but it might be a welcome addition. And there was they were funny these guys. More. <laughs> <laughs>